Welcome to Sam Conversation, a program of South Asia Monitor. I am Colonel Anil Bhatt, and we have with us Mr. Kom Carpentier de Gura. Namaskar. Good afternoon. Vice Admiral Shekhar Sinha. Namaskar. Mr. Kondapalli Shrikant. Namaskar. Mr. Kom Carpentier de Gura is an author, lecturer, columnist on geopolitics, international relations, cultural and scientific history, and oriental civilizations. A friend of the author of the book, Cheese China, um, Mr. Edel Secondat. Mr. Carpentier is uh, an advisor, consultant with the India Foundation. Admiral Shekhar Sinha retired in 2014 as the com commander in chief of the Western Naval Command. Uh, being a naval aviator, he's held major appointments as that in the Directorate of Naval Aviation also. Uh, He's been a uh, flag officer, naval aviation. He's flown the Seahawks and Sea Harriers and uh, was also the in charge of the Western Seaboard. Then he was chief of integrated defense staff. Um, He was also part of a Ministry of Home Affairs Committee on Island Security. Professor Kondapalli Srikant, um, if I go into his uh, full, um, you know, just uh, by data covering his qualifications, uh, we may run out of time. But uh, I think suffice to say that he learned his Chinese in China, in Beijing has taught in more than one uh, institution in Beijing and in other cities of China. Um, he's authored two very, I consider very important books on the PLA and on the PLA Navy. And uh, also been, uh, you know, co-edited co some other books on China and written a few monographs also. Our subject today is Can his China be a friend of India? First of all, I think um, Mr. Edel Secondat must be, you know, lauded for over 10 years that he stayed there, 2010 to 2020, he has recorded with a very sharp mind what, you know, he absorbed with a lot of traveling and interaction, wide interaction that he had with people there. I think just a couple of sentences which form his preface are worth reading. Wandering around in an empty COVID affected China, the author tries to take stock of the past decade. That means the decade 2010, 2020. The society emerging under the rule of President Xi Jinping is from a foreign perspective, either a model or a counter model. The country is covered with mind-blowing infrastructure that makes even United States look outdated. The currency in digitizing, and this brings the change in the social order. 
social life is transforming too. A new nation is breaking ground. We are fascinated and see both our desires and our fears playing before us. This book is neither pro-China nor Sinophobic. It, it invites readers to peer inside the Chinese laboratory, as he calls it. The author who lived and worked there tells us in his own style the tale he witnessed. Once far away, China seems now so close with both her best and worst aspects clearly visible. Well, we thank Mr. Secondad for whatever he has made visible to us because thanks to the Communist Party of China, if they can help it, nothing, nothing at all should be visible or audible from what is happening there. Without going too far more, I'll request uh, that um, we let's start with uh, Mr. Kom Kapintia. Your comments, please. Thank you, Coronel Bhatt, and uh, greetings to my co-participants. I, I guess I have the honor of speaking first simply because I happen to know the author and have uh, helped in getting his book published in India in English. I would make uh, a few introductory statements after what you said about the book and why it is original and important. We get so much information daily now about Chinese, uh, the Chinese economy, about the Chinese strategy, about the way in which uh, the party rules the country, and about the contentions and the conflicts with the United States, with neighbors, and the growing collaboration with Russia and with a few other countries, such as Iran. But we rarely get exposed to the inner life of China, how, as it is perceived uh, not only by foreigners, but even by its citizens, because uh, Edel Seconda has uh, been able, through his many years of study of China and his deep knowledge of Chinese classical literature, has been able to observe the mutation, the evolution of Chinese society, and to see how people in China, average people, react uh, to uh, the transformation they are not only witnessing, they are being part of. So, of course, uh, I can only touch upon a few uh, topics that the author uh, discusses briefly, but in a very enlightening way. For example, the fact that uh, the very concentration of technological power into a few major companies, such as WeChat, Alipay, with regard to electronic money, for example, digital money, or Huawei, with regard to telecommunication, that has given enormous focus an enormous penetration to the new technologies. You see, capitalist economies have tended to split up uh, discovery and uh, technological progress amongst many companies. And the author shows how that has also, in a way, reduced the efficiency of certain technologies in their power to promote reform. For example, in the West, we are far from a digital currency, whether you like the idea or not, because there are just too many companies proposing forms of payment. And as a result, people are not sure which one they should take, and it becomes too complicated. Whereas in China, you either have WeChat or Alipay, and that pretty much takes care of all payments, as a result of which, uh, because of the extensive deployment of cameras that can identify faces uh, in the minutest details, people no longer need to carry purses or uh, even credit cards. They simply show their face uh, at a particular dispenser and uh, get what they want. And immediately, the money is deducted from their account, and they get the notification on their phones. As a result, not only are old-fashioned methods of communication uh, uh, disappearing, but even computers are disappearing, because uh, phones are replacing them, which in my mind is a terrible thing, but uh, <laughs> I can only watch without necessarily having an input into it. 
And likewise, uh, you know, in terms of technology, it was very interesting. Many people in the West had the prejudice about China that uh, the most advanced technologies could not easily uh, sort of uh, take root in China because there was two different cultures with a very cumbersome writing system, a very different kind of uh, language, which would not be easily adapted to the intricacies of technology. And this was a typical prejudice of Americans, Anglo-Saxons saying, you know, the Chinese are not smart enough. Uh, we can make them imitate what we do and they can make it for us in large quantities, but they won't go beyond that. And we will keep uh, going ahead and we will stay on the cutting edge. Now that- Thank you, um, Mr. Carpenter. I will request you to stop here only for the time being. All right. Admiral Sinha, would you please <laughs> throw some light on what you think of uh, Mr. Secondat's thoughts in the book, how they relate to us. Well, uh, thank you, Colonel Bhatt, for inviting me here for this uh, discussion. Well, if I have to say, uh, you know, in few lines, I would say that uh, Mr. Secondat's book uh, is some kind of a very path-breaking oh. book that I have read on China. Though I must uh, quickly uh, honestly accept that I have not read the full book, but I have read it in chapters and some chapters that I will be talking about. Uh, the good thing about this book is uh, it's a story of a journey. And during the story of a journey, he talks about uh, uh, people. Uh, none of these are to do with uh, you know, matters of security. None of these are matters of any military issues, but it talks about what do, how do people live? How does the uh, Chinese sort of Communist Party or the government, uh, what is it that they provide to the students, to grown-up people, to the society, uh, which ultimately makes them so, uh, shall I say, the accepting the Communist Party and the Communist rules so easily uh, that it is very difficult to uh, imagine that uh, China will, uh, you know, accept anything else other than a uh, other than the rule that it is uh, doing right now. And uh, though I have some, <clears throat> sorry, though we ha I have some points to make where uh, um, I have a little bit of difference of opinion, but that's for later. Uh, but I think the all in all, this book is a, it's a marvelous book than the chapters that I have written. It goes as a story. And uh, once you start reading, and if you are a, you know, so-called uh, sinophobic like people like us, <laughs> Dr. Kondapali Shikhan, Maybe not comb is not so much comb is a much more uh, sort of academically inclined than I am and myself. So you will find that uh, at the end of the day, you know, initially you tend to write off in your mind whenever you hear something good about China. You say, no, it is not possible, or they are lying, they are doing this fraud, they are you know, projecting it in the picture. But when you read this book, at some point in time, you get a feeling that are we carrying some baggage on our back? Is it the baggage that we have accepted that whatever China does is wrong? Because when you see how people feel about the governance there, people feel about the economy there, uh, and people feel about, okay, what, are, what is all this about? Governance is all about prosperity. And if we are prospering, to hell with you. You can have a liberal order, you can have an illiberal order. How does it matter? So I think it's a, uh, this, is, this is a book which I will say that, you know, it is something to take pause, for, particularly for uh, some of us uh, you know, who are not very open to this kind of, particularly people in the security domain. But I think it makes you uh, realize that there is more to China. Chinese society is more complex than what we think it is. Uh, the education system, uh, regrettably, it is not the best at the levels of uh, you know lower down schooling and maybe initial bit of college, but uh, they expect the teachers to be very good, uh, and therefore the categorization is that of teachers and not so much of students. So teachers are uh, we absolutely you know, revered as in very high esteem, uh, and therefore you will find that the intelligentsia class is actually in those uh, those sort of uh, blocks. And why it is this book gives you a reasonably passing mention of this, or you have to read between the lines and draw your own conclusions. So I'll stop here and I will talk about the differences later. But I think it's a book uh, worth reading, not once, but a number of times if you were to understand the 
or if you want to understand the Chinese society, I mean, after all, it is hundred years of current Communist Party. Why is it that single party rule is surviving? Because you know they have always been used to one man show. One man is the rule. You go back to history; it has always been you know so and so dynasty, so and so dynasty, where one person you know held the stick and ruled. So now is probably holding the stick, but slightly softer stick, but is still ruling. So people are used to having a single party rule, a single person. So I think there is a, a lot of things which can be derived. In fact, one book can be written on this book. I mean, I, I'll only request uh, Dr. Kondapalli Shrikant to maybe uh, let me do my PhD on this book <laughs> under his under his guidance, <laughs> which I have tried so many times. I have not managed to write. <laughs> No, so you, that is uh, what I think, Colonel. But I think I'll leave it. No, thank you, thank you, Anushna. You screen. you brought out some very uh, pertinent points. But um, um, Professor Shrikant, I consider you a very very important weapon in the Indian arsenal. You know, when you, I I call my agency Word Sword. You know, the sword of words. You have. You have such a repository of, you know, the amount you studied. Um, anyway, we, we, because that will that will actually take very long. But um, your comments on the book and how it's going to be played. You see, Mr. Secondat's um, stay ended in 2020. So although he makes a very significant mention of the word Wuhan by saying calling it the Wuhan quarantine, which began with what happened the quarantine in China began with what happened in Wuhan. But um, how is going to play out? How it's going to relate to us? Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, uh, speaking uh, at the Sam uh, meeting today to discuss about Edel Sekandat's book on She's China. Um, uh, the uh, other um, panelists have also been able to be very uh, considerate in uh, uh, praising Sekandat for his uh, uh, valuable uh, contribution. Uh, I very personally uh, associate with uh, Sekandat's uh, images that he uh, builds up uh, over a, a period of time in 10 years. Uh, I lived in China myself uh, for three years uh, and I frequently visit China and teach in the uh, four universities uh, in China. So many of the things that he had discussed, uh, I myself have gone through many of those moments. Uh, and so let me congratulate Mr. Sekandar for bringing uh, China to the global audience. Uh, what is happening in China to the global audience. That's a very valuable contribution because uh, there are these uh, East Asian societies have uh, fields of onion. Uh, you keep peeling, 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 uh, still you do not get the pungent uh, flavor. Uh, so there is a, a problem about Confucianism uh, not being very transparent like Western societies or even in India where we have uh, so much of uh, the media gauge uh, to unravel things. So I think his contribution in this book is to put across to the global community uh, what is happening in China on very, very crucial subjects. Um, as Admiral Sina mentioned, it's not about security. It's not about foreign policy. It's not about strategic issues, but it is about the day-to-day -day life of the Chinese, which hardly any media person or a scholar uh, discusses. So I think his major contribution is in this format. Uh, number two is his unique style uh, in the form of uh, letters um, that he posted from China during this last decade. So that is uh, in a very uh, uh, informal manner that he writes so the writing skill is very, very um, friendly in nature uh, in putting across the basics uh, without assuming concepts or any. He provides for the down-to-earth approach rather than a top-to-bottom 
kind of approach. Uh, so I think this is a major contribution. Uh, the other third is that the uh, how China is going through globalization. Um, of course, under the Communist Party's rule and under the Communist Party's gauge, uh, as President Xi Jinping mentioned in the Davos meeting, they are leading the globalization process uh, and are critiquing the protectionist trends, trade protectionist trends. Uh, across the globe. Of course, China is also a very highly protectionist market. Uh, we realize in India because no Indian software is present in any state-owned enterprises, while BSNL uh, in India has 90% of the telecom equipment from China. So that is the, uh, the, the level of differentiation between China and India in terms of globalization. So the author speaks much about the globalization aspects, including on internet control, digitalized economy, currency related corruption, which is a political aspect, social credit related issues, education system, the <laughs> online teaching, filial <laughs> piety, uh, or the infrastructure that they have built with over $10 trillion in the last, say, uh, four decades of reform and opening up. But the emptiness out of all these buildings, because people do not own these buildings, unlike in India, unlike in the West where they have the social capital. But here is, uh, the author also speaks about the identity cards, which uh, actually is the basis for the social control. Also in terms of the ethnic dimensions in Xinjiang, in uh, other ethnic areas, that is important because we are going through the European Union Parliament, uh, European Parliament restrictions or sanctions on the uh, Uyghur related, uh, human rights related aspects. So this is very, very relevant, handy at the moment in explaining the background from a bottom up approach. Finally, he has also, uh, in terms of the keyboards, uh, Chinese, how do they type? Uh, and the Communist Party uh, control over the society. So broadly, these are areas where many people deem it uh, not very important, but many people also do not have much information about these issues. So, Thank you, <laughs> Professor Krigan, for your observations. Uh, except that if I may comment on Galwan, they certainly got the Galwan was the second rude shock they got. I say that the first rude shock that the PLA got was in 1967 at Sikkim, Natula Sikkim, Natula and Chola Sikkim, where they got a taste of what a normally organized Indian Army battalion can do. In 62, they got away with what um, a disorganized, a, you know, poorly armed, poorly clad army, Indian army was doing. And even there, there are, there are, so, there are soldiers still, you know, frozen in time in some of the snows who we haven't recovered, whose fingers are still on the trigger. But 67, they got their wood chalk when they, we lost 67, they lost almost 400 PLA soldiers. They lost a convoy full of vehicles and a few hundred bunkers. And from that time onwards, they said, let's do everything bulletlessly. Uh, we, we followed it. They did not, they followed it bulletlessly, but they broke the principle of force on 20th October, 1975 against four Assam rifles, riflemen who were killed, but not by bullets, by torture. The bullets finally flew on the one night in September 2020, when uh, a detachment of Chinese tried to climb up to Kailash, uh, you know, one of the heights at in the Kailash Ridge. Anyway, um, Mr. Carpentier, Coming back to um, 
you know, his um, second act's stay uh, ended in 2020. He's given, a, I'll say, he's given a, in, in what we in, in Hindi call a jalak, you know, a glance, a glimpse of what um, uh, if someone like him, if he'd stayed longer, we could really have got some very, very telling, uh, you know, facts about what is happening there. Yes, well, uh, I would like to come back to what uh, Dr. Kondapali said with regard to the military uh, clashes and the confrontation between uh, India and China. Because one point which I think is very relevant in the book by Mr. Segonda is a not a very deep look, but still a very revealing look into the state of the Chinese armed forces. Now, we know that there are reforms being carried out, and there is an accelerated drive towards modernization and uh, fully technological warfare. Otherwise, the quality of the Chinese armed forces is open to doubt, except perhaps for a few elite units, because we can see that uh, a lot of the promotions, for example, are uh, dependent on party affiliations, friendships, family ties, and favors done to officials. I mean, there is a clear reference to that. For example, the picturesque episode of the bottles of Mutai that can be given sometimes perhaps to higher ups in the army, which facilitate the promotion of the <laughs> soldiers uh, who otherwise are very poorly paid. Now, this is not uh, something that we should take for granted because uh, we all know that many armies have problems with regard to manpower, the US Military forces are also not exactly a top ranking fighting force if you look at most of the units. So uh, we cannot uh, derive too many conclusions from that. But it's interesting because it shows us the weaknesses, the flaws in the Chinese system, uh, which obviously is, has to be somehow ideologically driven in spite of uh, Deng Xiaoping's appeal for efficiency, reliance on results. You know, a cat, I don't care whether a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. And the other famous statement that uh, socialism and communism are not about being poor. So clearly he was trying to move people away from ideology. But the ideology remains fundamental because that's what holds the country together, or at least that is what keeps the party in power. So ideology has to be periodically brought back to the fore, even though most people may not really believe in it. And the interesting mix of Confucianism, traditional Chinese culture, and communism produces a very unpredictable mix, you know, uh, we can see that communist uh, cultures, or rather, we might say, uh, Confucian cultures have been able to adapt pretty well to communism. Uh, we can see that in North Korea, we can see that in China and in other places, I mean, Vietnam, and etc. I mean, they are Confucian in the cultural sense. But this being said, I would also like to point out, and the author also hints at that, that China does not only have a, a government and a communist party, it has also a large underworld. And that is something which influences many of the Chinese policies, in the sense you are looking at mafias. Despite the control of the communist party, <coughs> mafias are either not, I mean, they cannot be eradicated or they are tolerated because like most governments, there are agreements, there are bridges, you know, between the government and the mafia. Essentially, they learn to coexist because they can be useful to one another. So that's another thing which I think comes out between the lines in the book. Thank you, Mr. Carpentier. Admiral Sinan, I now request you to give your winding up comments. Well, I think uh, uh, Dr. Srikant has uh, really uh, said all that uh, that stands out there. Uh, I, as a sort of a student of uh, China, not only security, but off late about uh, politics by society and, uh, you know, the culture. Uh, one line that he has mentioned, um, uh, Mr. Sekandar, and I quite appreciate that, though he has not given a, a great amount of explanation, but he has come to this conclusion, and I uh, completely agree, and I would like to venture into uh, stating as to uh, why is he say why is he, is he saying so, and there's one uh, issue in which I differ with some of the comments which have been written on this book. It says that China is in preparatory phase. This is on page 96. 
uh, where it is building up an enormous cultural production capacity, one day China will wake up and will make use of this investment. But if hundreds of flowers are to blossom again, it implies that social life and agitation are to be set free as well. Uh, that day, Chinese people will really exit lockdown. But it is difficult to imagine a cultural liberalization under this current regime. So this last line is extremely important. Why? Uh, you know, the Chinese in many places have quoted uh, that there is somebody in Fudan University who is writing about the cultural, civilizational uh, nature of China, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, it should be Confucian in nature. But uh, you know, when you meet the people in Chinese society, they really don't know what what are they following. <laughs> There's quite a mixed uh, feeling amongst the people. They're a confused lot. I have uh, many friends, and I'm sure that uh, Kom and uh, Dr. Shikan may be having many more. I haven't spent so much of time. I have only made a uh, number of visits. Uh, I think that China um, stopped being a civilizational country when the Communist Party took over the reins of its administration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Admiral Sina. There are very uh, many relevant uh, observations, of course. Professor Srikant, I'll leave it to you to wind the, you know, there's, there's so much more we can speak about, but I think some um, summing up uh, com comments from you would be in order. Thank you very much. I very much agree with the, uh, the previous two uh, reviewers of the book. Uh, Admiral Sinha mentioned about the, uh, the uh, inability of the Chinese students to raise cousins. Uh, this is part of the Confucianism that uh, most of them have. Uh, in Confucianism, they are not supposed to cousin the teacher uh, because uh, if you go to Chufu, the birthplace of Confucius, sure. uh, uh, when you enter the temple, you have a Chinese character, Wan Shu Shu Piao, uh, which basically roughly translated for, for 10,000 generations, which basically means forever. For 10,000 generations, you are my teacher. Uh, so, so not to question this. And uh, uh, since uh, second art is a Frenchman, uh, so let me say a joke. In many universities, the most unruly students are the Indians and the French. Uh, <laughs> even before the instructor says something, they will start raising a question. Uh, and, the, and the most obedient uh, of the students are from China, Japan, yeah. Korea. Yeah. They never ask any question, <laughs> which means that either they understood 100%, or they did not understand anything. <laughs> uh, so that is quite possible. And this has been also my uh, experience. But let me also recount one of the um, experiences that I have when I was teaching. Uh, so one day I was teaching uh, for MA students, the, uh, the Thomas Friedman's uh, The World is Flat uh, and the Globalization and Internet, uh, all these uh, uh, IT companies. So one girl stood up and said, this is all Indian propaganda. Wow. <laughs> uh, meaning thereby that there is so much of uh, Indian software uh, success stories. And yeah. these are kind of conspiracies for them. Uh, of course, China today did uh, quite good in terms of the IT hardware and IT software by marrying the Taiwanese hardware, Japanese hardware, and the Indian hardware. So many of the premiers or Chinese leaders who visited India, they had an uh, inadvertent visit to either Mumbai or to Bangalore or to Chennai or Hyderabad. So, so there is a plan for integration of the IT software with that of the IT hardware they were receiving. And that's how they became almost an IT superpower uh, in the recent times. If you look at their semiconductor industry and others. The author also mentions about the Huawei, Zati, uh, the WeChat, Alipay. Um, of course, recently we have seen 
uh, the Chinese government putting a lot of restrictions on private enterprises, uh, including uh, Jack Ma's um, Alibaba. Uh, Alibaba and Ant Group. Uh, some $2 billion uh, fines have been imposed, uh, which suggests that it is here the Communist Party, which is the leader rather than. Uh, also, the author mentions about the role of the party state in triggering inventions or even copying of the materials from the West. Uh, for example, James Mulvenon argued that the Huawei received $85 billion of subsidies uh, in order to uh, develop the 5G networks. Uh, so this is violative of the WTO procedures, uh, World Trade Organization procedures. Um, nevertheless, China still circulates the Huawei 5G all across the globe. Uh, and clearly there is a party state imprint uh, in this. Uh, there is uh, so many insights that the author had made. What Sekandar did was to uh, integrate with the Chinese society in order to get the impressions that were reflected in the book. Uh, so this is a major achievement by the author. Let me again congratulate. And if I may touch upon a comment of his about curiosity killing the cat, he mentions that in China, it can kill much more than the cat. <laughs> so, um, gentlemen, it was, uh, thank you very much for your very profound observations, comments on Mr. Sekandat's book, which is of, uh, I'll say, great importance to any uh, Indian who's, you know, who's thinking about w which direction his country is going, her country is going, and what is to be done. Uh, particularly now, which is the second year of the, I don't know whether to call it merely COVID-19 or the, or the virus that he leaked out or was made to leak out from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All the best to you. Thank you. Bye -bye.